Yeah. Well, um, actually, firstly, thank you very much to the Society for inviting me. Um, I might be second best, but I'll try and do, do, do what I can. Uh, um, thank you very much for looking after me so well. Um, would you like to come for dinner beforehand? I haven't quite realised just how much of a treat that was going to be. So thank you very much um, to the Society for that. Okay, so um, what I want to talk about are some threats to our wildlife. And I want to talk about um, a couple of case studies, really, which are about One Health, which are those uh, health issues that affect humans and livestock and wildlife. And really, we've got an old case study and a newer case study. And before we, so we'll, you know, split the talk then into these two halves of a sort of a, a new one first, and then we'll go to an old one. Uh, just to say something about myself, um, I worked at the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust for, for donkey's years. I've been very closely associated with WWT at Slimbridge, um, really even from when I did my PhD back then. And even though I've worked in other places, I then um, worked at WWT quite recently uh, for about 20 something years, but left just at the beginning of the pandemic um, to do some other work, uh, but work very close, closely with them still on the lead poisoning issue. So I'm still a research fellow there at WWT, and I was the, it was head of ecosystem health or something prior to that. And now I do various other bits of work, uh, for example, with the conventional migratory species um, as their counsellor for wildlife health. So still a lot of health work, but still very closely related to WWT. So just to say something about me as a person um, from the northeast of England, uh, always fascinated uh, with birds and always very interested in cutting open dead things. That was a real sort of fascination. So I'm a biologist and although the sciencey bit and here's, you know, some viral um, genomics, even though the sciencey bit is very interesting and I've had, you know, a lot of, um, you know, doing the science, you know, trying to understand the, the data and all the rest of it. What really drives me now is much uh, when it comes to health issues is what is it that caused it and what is it that we can do to put it right? That, that's the thing that really gets me a bit more motivated. So a lot of the work then that um, I did at WWT was around writing guidance thinking about the people actually who've got the power to stop the health problem in the first place is very often the person who's actually managing the land in some way. So in lots of ways, um, the medics, unless you're in you know, very preventative medicine, are sort of at the end having to deal with the problem and ideally very interested in the bit that sort of manages the system right in the first place um, so that you don't have the problem. And then that's why, for example, with the conventional migratory species, and we're really looking at how do you manage the environment better so that you are not then um, allowing pandemics to um, break out and so on. So that's really what motivates me, the sort of what, how, you know, what caused it and then what do you do about it at the end rather than the science, which is actually my, um, my actual training. So, so the first case study then is about avian influenza. And this is a, a new One Health case study. I say new in that it's um, still relatively new. We're looking at about 15 years worth or so of, of this issue um, being in wild birds. But certainly recently we've seen um, avian influenza as an unprecedented health crisis for water birds and seabirds. And uh, for those of you who are not so familiar with avian <coughs> influenza viruses, those are sort of avian influenza 101, um, they are very um, highly variable viruses. Their taxonomy is all based on the H's and the N's. So that's your hemagglutinins and your neuraminidases that are sitting on the outside of those viruses, these um, different proteins. And they can reassort, so you get these different H types with different N types, and they are mutating at a very high rate. Like human influenza viruses, you know that they are mutating a lot, which is why your vaccine changes year on year. Avian influenza viruses um, are very similar. And they are classified into two um, sorts, low pathogenic viruses and highly pathogenic viruses. So HPAI, highly pathogenic avian influenza. And historically, we would have always just associated that the low pathogenic viruses were out there in a big old reservoir in um, waders and wildfowl, and they would have flown around the world for you know, millennia with these low pathogenic viruses, not causing any particularly um, harsh disease within the, the host birds. Um, 
But all of these viruses, they've got a zoonotic potential. So that word zoonotic, which I think we are a bit more familiar with um, post pandemic, the ability to be transmissible then to um, humans from animals. So a, you know, a pathogen, whether it's bacteria, a virus or whatever that can easily transmit or is readily naturally transmit between um, an animal and a human. But the, the conversion of these low pathogenic viruses to high pathogenic viruses um, almost all happen in intensive poultry production situations. So that's where um, you know, these viruses uh, are mutating all the time and they will randomly um, you know, put out a highly pathogenic version. But when you are in that intensive poultry production setting, that's where they really take off. And what you can see um, on the right hand side there is as our poultry production has increased, then we're seeing more and more um, outbreaks of highly pathogenic avian influenza. And so what we're looking at with um, the virus that first emerged, which I'll really focus on for, for this bit of the talk, H5N1, an unprecedented one health issue. And that was something then affecting <coughs> humans because humans were catching this from poultry um, with a the potential there for a pandemic. So there's a lot of um, interest from the World Health Organization to, to really track what mutations were happening within that virus, um, to see whether it was taking on the characteristics of something that would be easily transmissible then between humans, if humans then caught it from a bird. Um, but also in terms of livestock, um, these are notifiable diseases, meaning you have to tell the sort of authorities and that has um, extreme <coughs> consequences then for the economy of your country, but also in terms of livelihoods and food security and so on as well. Um, but also yeah. conservation consequences. So you can see it's a, a one health issue really affecting all of those different sectors. So the virus I'm talking about here, H5N1, it emerged in 1996 in a, a domestic goose um, setting in China and really um, uh, between sort of 1996 and 2004 it really was a sort of Asian poultry virus and I suppose what happened then that was the most significant event the thing that then you know brings me into this story is what happened in the spring of 2005 where this virus which is known as the Goose Guangdong virus, the GSGD, you'll see in, in various bits of the literature, it was responsible for the first major outbreak in wild birds at a place called Lake Qinghai in China, where it killed about 6,000 um, resident and migratory birds, including bar-headed geese and all sorts of other things. My, my colleague um, at Slimbridge at the time, Eileen Reese, said, oh, Ruth, there's this terrible outbreak of bird flus happened in China in wild birds. And I'm like, oh, I said, oh, that's really weird. You know, those things don't happen in wild birds. I'm sure it will fizzle itself out. It will burn itself out. I, don't know, I was completely wrong. So, so this is very unusual. We just haven't seen this sort of thing in wild birds before. But really, the genie was out of the bottle at that stage. And what we think happened from Lake Qinghai, which the sort of egg shaped um, blob um, represents there, is that probably survivors from that outbreak took virus with them north to Mongolia and also into central Russia. And then from that bit of central Russia, um, birds traveling south that autumn, which would ordinarily be traveling um, and wintering around the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. It happened to be a particularly terrible winter, that winter. So birds were pushed much further south and west mm -hmm. because the Caspian and the Black Seas were um, uh, in a large way actually sort of frozen. So in that case, you know, we have all these birds really from central Russia, slightly unusual migration then to have them so far west and south. So we then saw H5N1, which had been in China earlier that year, suddenly in Western Europe. It was a sort of an extraordinary thing that happened. And of course, what's worth understanding is that the world is filled with flyways of birds essentially going up and down the world. You know, birds aren't really going kind of east to west necessarily. But of course, these flyways, they overlap. Um, so the majority of birds will be traveling up and down. But for a virus that then exists in uh, and can cope very well with being in the environment as well, you can see that birds taking it to a wetland, then other birds might pick it up from that wetland and so on and so on. 
So um, we could see then how this virus might move about in these flyways. And at its worst, it had moved from China right across the world and off into um, Western Europe and down into Africa as well. And this is during the time sort of 2003 to 2008. So we saw this really wide global distribution of H5N1. But I, I need to say at this point that wild birds are only part of this picture. This is not just about wild birds because um, there are other um, very common routes of transmission of avian influenza viruses and this particular virus. And the main spread is via poultry products and poultry being moved around either locally and um, really being maintained a lot in wet markets um, in Asia where you have living birds that are still replicating virus. Um, and you know, that's very easy then to, to be transmitted. But also it's worth understanding the amount of um, poultry trade that there is around the world. That graphic at the bottom, the, the green um, lines there are actually where poultry are moved around the world. And in many ways, you could say that chickens are possibly more migratory than migratory birds. But obviously there is um, very often good uh, veterinary health surveillance though of those. However, there's still plenty of virus moving around in poultry. But it's not just poultry. Of course, there is the pet bird trade and that's both legal and illegal. And certainly we've had um, cases in the UK of pet bird trade bringing that H5N1 virus into the country. And some research done there that um, illustrates about a quarter of the movements of pet or wild birds um, or yeah, the, the wild animal trade and um, pet trade, about a quarter of those movements actually don't have any sort of um, veterinary surveillance because they're illegal movements. And on top of that, people can move viruses about on their vehicles um, and on fomites, in inanimate objects that can then move um, you know, virus about. So for example, yeah, vehicles or food lorries. <clears throat> so you can see here how this virus might move about. So in terms of WWT, I have to say about 2005, it was just a, such a horrendous year because suddenly we had this awful threat. And if I'm, I'm assuming, have, have most of you been to Slimbridge at some point in your life? Um, you can really see why it would frighten the what's it out of us because we we have you know captive birds there you know Peter Scott was an extraordinary conservationist and absolute visionary but he you know he wasn't big necessarily on biosecurity so we had this setup of really a zoological collection within a nature reserve where we've got people so I would say that well the amount of contingency planning that we did I mean it, it really you know became such a huge part my job and, and a number of my colleagues but it wasn't just about organizational planning for how to protect the captive birds how to protect our visitors and so on um, we also at wwt have, um, have got skills in wildlife health but skills in wild bird movements and you know what birds do and as a consequence then we were able to assist defra with our um, with their risk assessments for the country or on the local scale with outbreak responses. So for example, if you have an outbreak, we were on this ornithological expert panel, which would then, you know, we could say, well, actually we know that it's an outbreak in mute swans and we know the mute swans there probably go, you know, not that far, blah, blah. So we could um, help sort of work out risks from um, outbreaks where the virus might go next, but also with surveillance. And I'll just show a few slides really of the um, sort of surveillance that we were able to sort of launch almost immediately you know there was a, a sort of crisis there at the end of 2005 and we were able to quickly say okay defra you want surveillance of lots of you know live birds we, we can catch you lots of birds and we can do that surveillance for you so um at a, a number of the wwt centers this happens to be the one in scotland at calaverock on the solway firth we have been trapping birds for years as part of monitoring projects. And then we could use those traps like this. And here's a, a load of hooper swans all, all trapped or there's the uh, swan pipe at Slimbridge where we're catching Buick swans and ducks and so on. So we could trap large numbers of birds to do the su surveillance. I think I probably wouldn't be doing this now. At the time, we didn't know whether this virus was actually in wild birds. So we were you know, pretty sure that the prevalence was, was pretty low. And I think, 
this winter, I probably wouldn't recommend doing this because we know the prevalence of the virus at the moment is, is much higher. But we were able to use um, not just those swan pipes, but also things uh, like these duck traps. So that, um, that one on the left there is a teal trap. And if you know your, your wild birds, teal are you know, lovely little ducks that like to squeeze through vegetation. They will squeeze into the mouth of that trap because they can see the food there that's been put out, but then it's like a sort of lobster pot. They can't come back out. So we were able to trap lots of little ducks this way. And if you've been to Slimbridge um, and seen the reserve manager working the traditional duck decoy, it's it's worth seeing. So you use a, a duck to lure, you use a dog to lure ducks into a pipe to catch them, which sort of sounds like that shouldn't work. Sounds like the dog should frighten the ducks away, but the ducks want to keep their eye on the predator. So they follow the, the dog up and you can see the dog there looks like a fox. So it sort of increases the ducks the likelihood of, of following them. And then we could trap the birds and then do surveillance. So even using techniques there like cannon netting, you know, which is a really powerful way um, of uh, catching a lot of birds at once. You have to put a lot of hours into making sure that the net that you have dug into the ground is in the right place. But um, so we were able to catch them, as I say, a lot of birds for, for DEFRA um, to really um, you know, get a much better understanding of, of what wild birds were, were doing in terms of spreading this virus. And I have to say, in all that wild bird trapping that we did, we didn't actually find any virus at all, which was quite heartening in some ways. So lots and lots of swabbing went on for a good number of years. It's worth saying that um, this is, it was quite an intensive way of trying to do surveillance. And actually that surveillance has now been shifted. So now it is just dead bird surveillance that um, DEFRA or the Animal Plant Health Agency do. So at WWT, we have patrols of the, the 10 sites and uh, looking out for dead birds and taking samples from those and submitting those. But it wasn't just the UK work for avian influenza. WWT, because we had this sort of expertise in water bird monitoring and the health side of things, then it certainly brought about a, a huge sort of demand for, for our skills to frankly go and see some really, you know, rather fabulous places. So anyway, there's me with my lovely colleague, Richard Hearn, and he and I, well, yeah, we, we saw some fabulous places and went to some had some crazy experiences doing surveillance in, in various parts of the world as I was just putting this together. So that was in Greenland. And I, I, I put that photograph in top left there with that enormous rucksack. And unfortunately, I feel like in the last 10 years, I've done more and more policy stuff. There is no way on the planet I could carry a rucksack <laughs> like that anymore. Anyway, it, I obviously wasn't fitter at the time. Um, and there's uh, surveillance by day and surveillance by night there in Bangladesh. We ended up, the, the easiest way for us to catch birds happened to be at night in, in mist nets and so on. It was all a bit um, hairy. Anyway, so lots of avian influenza surveillance and training as well. So we ran training courses at WWT. People came from other countries, you know, to come to Slimbridge, but it's usually better to go in country, you know, to um, see what works best in a, a sort of local setting. So that was a, a, a three week course that we did in Nigeria of, you know, uh, teaching the trapping techniques, but the water bird monitoring and um, skills to go with it um, and so on. So just to talk though about the impacts on wild birds. So you could see early on here from sort of 2005 and in the next couple of years, we were really losing large numbers of birds in different places. And this direct impact, um, you know, we could really see for the first time, these viruses were, were killing large numbers of birds. In that first outbreak, we thought it was something like 10% of the global population of bar-headed geese were lost. And uh, there were even mortality in threatened species like um, that's a red-breasted goose on the, um, on the right hand side. So really wild birds, they were um, vectors possibly, but also victims as well of, of this virus. But in some ways, um, possibly that the greater impact at that stage, I think was some of the indirect impact because there was um, various killing of wild birds. I, I remember some um, crazy Russian guy who was asking for all, you know, 
grown men with a gun to take up arms to, to shoot the birds from the skies. This, these, this was the sort of narrative that was going on during those early times. It was really quite dark. People were knocking nests off their houses because they were afraid that the house martins would come and kill them all. Um, wetlands were either being drained or degraded. And some of the responses were things like you know, pouring disinfectant into natural wetlands and these sorts of things, which would actually do more harm than good. And then research was suspended and, and so on. So there was a real sort of public fear and paranoia. And in terms of conservation, um, because of course at WWT, it's all about trying to get people to really love those birds, to really <laughs> want to do the right thing, to really try and save them. So to have this sort of paranoia going on about bird flu was, they, yeah, they were definitely very dark times. And of course, the Sun newspaper was massively responsible as usual and had its ducks of death montage. You know, this sort of <coughs> sense that the birds were going to come rain death all over us. This was, you know, the local newspaper for Slimbridge at the time. You know, we had journalists hiding in bushes and taking, oh, you know, it, it was just, it was pretty grim, really. So to go back to my original point of, you know, what, you know, what is motivating is the trying then to, to put it right, to get people to do the right thing and so on. So what we knew was if people were, um, you know, wanting to kill birds or destroy their wetlands um, or whatever, we knew we needed some kind of global mandate. This, this was a global problem. So, um, I think this really will have, that's what started me going from, you know, carrying a big rucksack into sort of sitting by my desk most of the time now, doing much more environmental policy work and working with the multilateral environmental agreements to then get resolutions. So just like the climate conference of parties, the climate COP is going on at the moment, the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands have got their COP happening this week. And at this particular one then, for example, we had a resolution there with lots of guidance the parties. So the majority of the world's countries are signatories to the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. And, you know, they are then signing up to our resolution that says, you know, do decent surveillance, don't kill your birds, blah, blah, you know, here's guidance for what you can do. And that's quite a powerful mandate. And you occasionally have to remind your own government mm -hmm. that they've agreed not to, you know, kill birds, if there's a, uh, kill wild birds, if there's an outbreak and so on. So but powerful ways to then just to try to get countries to do the right thing for, for their wild birds. But now to look at these viruses over time. So a lot of this focus um, I've just been talking about is in those kind of early days of this H5N1. But <coughs> in the intervening years, we had good years, bad years. We thought that the winter of 2016, 2017 was really terrible. I remember that being an awful winter but I don't think I'd imagined it was going to be quite as bad as we had seen last year and this year. It really has ramped up into something far more horrendous. And this slide here, um, as I say, that, you know, the 2016, 2017 um, year was bad, but it really has been quite awful these last two years. And the funny thing is between the two winters, you know, in, in Europe, we used to have, you know, a bit of time off in the summer because the virus kind of disappeared with the migrating wild birds. But for this year, it, it hung around during the summer. Um, and this uh, map here, it's actually, it's taken from a report that's from June. And so now it's even worse than it was, but you can see that it's all across um, Europe, outbreaks of H5N1 all across Europe, in captive birds, um, in wild birds, and also with millions of poultry then culled as part of um, you know, disease control programmes. So it's been the largest ever recorded outbreak of um, avian influenza. And I think the poor people who are working in the agencies, the APHA, who are dealing with these outbreaks, they, they must be absolutely just run off their feet. But something which was really quite um, extraordinary then that happened sort of over the winter, the you know, the winter just gone, is that our virus from Northwest Europe and probably as the sort of starting off point from the UK, traveled then to the States. And we know it probably uh, went from the UK, probably via Iceland and Greenland, and then turned up in North America in um, December. And we know from all the sort of fancy, um, you know, virology genomics that we can see that it is the same virus that has 
um, traveled then from Western Europe and into North America. And now this virus is moving across North America in the same way that we have seen it in the UK. And the scale of this outbreak, this really looks like it's a fitter virus. It is, um, it, it is really being passed on very readily between birds and, and causing very um, high mortality. And what's been so, um, I would say, I would not have imagined this happening. It's found itself into different settings. So from the water bird setting into seabird breeding colonies. And the, the picture there on the left is the gannetry on Bass Rock. And that shows all the pairs of gannets, as you'd expect. And you can see that this year, bird flu just got in and it has taken out so many. I mean, you know, to literally be able to see the impact of a disease like that is, it's really very depressing. On the Solway Firth, the barnacle geese um, from the Svalbard population, I mean, the colleagues at that uh, WWT centre there, you know, they were just having a horrendous time picking up thousands upon thousands of these dead barnacle geese. It's really awful. Great skewers, and the UK is a very important country for great skewers, but in some of those colonies where they breed, um, up to 80% of those birds had gone. Turns, very high mortality, 40% um, loss of uh, Dalmatian pelicans from this population and so on. So it's been an awful, awful year with very high levels of mortality. <coughs> and just to um, give a little sort of case study here, just because um, Coker Island off the Northumberland coast is, is dear to my heart. I grew up looking at it out my bedroom window. That's um, where I come from. And um, thank you to the uh, warden from Coker Island there and um, Ibrahim. Um, Alfawi, who has let me use his slides. Um, and I hope I can get this uh, video to work. <coughs> so here, here he is going out collecting um, dead birds. In fact, the, I saw some sort of WhatsApp messages he had in about May saying, well, this is a bit strange. I'm, I'm finding dead birds. They, they, you know, they look healthy. And his, you can see his colleagues saying, oh, I hope it's not bird flu. And so, you know, they are just at the, the beginning of this terrible realisation that they've got this awful thing that is about to sweep through um, their colonies that they've got of roseate terns, which is the only colony, um, you know, that, that we've got in this country, plus these arctic terns and common terns as well. And there he's picking up dead birds, but you can see, you know, the, the other birds are just coming and, you know, land, landing straight back. So it's really quite, quite miserable situation. Okay, so where do we go next with this thing? Um, I suppose our terrible fear is because we're dealing with a, a, a virus that seems to really be doing well, it, you know, it's a fitter virus, it, um, it can it, uh, really maintain itself within wild bird populations. And our worry is that from the Americas, it will go into South America and from where we are in Western Europe, it will travel further south as well in seabirds. And our worry is, of course, it will end up in places like um, albatross breeding colonies. And those kind of birds, they absolutely depend on very high levels of adult survival. They're just not evolved to cope with high numbers of adults being killed. That's not what goes on. They breed very slowly. Their populations maintain their stability by um, you know, just the adults going on and on. And so something coming in and taking out a large proportion of them, like bird flu might do, will be absolutely horrendous. I think we can expect some um, immunity of birds that have survived past um, infection. How long that will go on for, we're not absolutely sure. But, but that is our hope that, for example, in those gannet colonies, um, that some of those birds that have survived will um, have some immunity from it. And in many ways, again, you know, what is it then that we can do? Well, I think getting out the guidance that um, is already out there or that we may have, have written. So I, I end up being the sort of de facto coordinator of this um, Convention on Migratory Species and UN Food and Agriculture Organization Scientific Task Force on Avian Influenza and Wild Birds. And it, it's the only body that's really looking at this disease from the wild bird perspective. You know, ordinarily, it's the, the chicken side of things, you know, the wild birds are just the baddies, but this is the real one that tells you about how to do biosecurity in a natural setting and so on. 
And I would say then that um, this particular virus, it, it's a grim warning. And we, we wrote a, um, an editorial in, in Science just recently, really trying to, to you know, push this idea that actually, I know that we always think about our livestock and we think about our own health, but if we allow these uh, um, livestock diseases to escape to wildlife, you end up with the conservation consequences of it, but it will always come back and bite you on the bottom. It really is the right thing to really be focused on one health to make sure that they don't escape in the first place. So we have lots of different examples, <coughs> um, but bird flu certainly is, is a very good um, example of that. So the conclusions from this first half from our new One Health um, case study is that really WWT has been a, a real key player in this issue, really from that sort of history of a lot of water bird biology and so on, both in the UK and overseas. But I think we really have got a much fitter virus um, and it's found its way into novel settings. So I think that we have sort of witnessed a kind of paradigm shift. It was bad in the early days, but it seems really really bad now um, and so we've got birds really as rather hapless victims with mortality levels which are definitely of um, conservation concern and in terms of one health I think those um I think everybody was on the back foot this year I think that a lot of the national authorities really weren't very well planned for the wild bird side of things so you know we were focused on the, the poultry and uh, human health side of things and so that preparatory planning takes so many different agencies, but really we would say that you have to plan those things in peacetime. Doing it during an active outbreak is, has been absolute, an absolute nightmare, really. And the um, surveillance that we have, okay, it's fine for the poultry, but actually we really need conservation focus surveillance as well. Um, and if we're thinking about preventing infectious diseases from escaping and so on, we really need to be thinking about changes in our animal production things, but that really is a talk probably for a different time. So that, that's our new One Health case study. And so if you can bear with me whilst we then shift tack completely and head into our second case study. And the second case study then, it's an older One Health case study, which I feel has been around for donkey's years and donkey's years. And, and it's a very preventable One Health issue. And that's the um, issue of lead poisoning from ammunition. So whilst we were doing all that surveillance for avian influenza, <laughs> we've got all those birds together. Um, you can also do surveillance for other diseases as well. And with those hooper swans, for example, we found 42% of those hooper swans that we looked at had got lead levels that were so high that they should have cl you know, clinical lead poisoning, above you know, thresholds for clinical lead poisoning. And if we, what we know about lead is that it's immunosuppressive. So there's something about thinking about you've got those hideous viruses going around that you've got these kind of contaminated wild populations, which is a really sort of awful an awful thing to think about because of course those wild birds can be giving it to our poultry as well. So, you know, so a sobering thought. But just thinking about lead, cast our minds back, um, there's Diosterides saying that lead makes the mind give way. And I think that that probably sums up this particular issue that we're dealing with. It, it's got all sorts of crazinesses that, that go on. And lead, um, in fact, Barbara, I probably don't need to talk to you about, you know, lead being highly toxic. It's a non-essential, non-specific poison um, affecting virtually every physiological system, no safe level, and the effects are independent of the source. If it comes from petrol or from ammunition, whatever, it does what lead does when it's highly toxic. So again, a, a one health thing, which I will um, illustrate um, as, as we go through this talk. And it's because it's so toxic that that is why it has been regulated and phased out of petrol paint and pipes because of the impacts um, of that on, on people. But the, the, the big, um, you know, the, the last use standing really in, in many ways then is the use of lead ammunition. So if you think about a, a shotgun cartridge might have 300 pellets in it or so, and the majority of those then will be distributed in the environment when the shotgun um, cartridge is fired. 
And then um, birds, particularly birds with a gizzard, a big sort of muscular stomach, uh, will pick up pellets thinking that they are grit or maybe thinking they are seeds. Um, and I said, you know, we sometimes see <laughs> I saw a Canada goose on the um, post-mortem table with 400 and something rather pellets in it. And I just thought, it must have thought that they were seeds. Why would you eat so many? And, you know, where is it picking up 400? Anyway, blah, blah. So that, that we know is a very uh, well-established pathway to poisoning. Um, and in Europe, based on ingestion rates, we would calculate it's about a billion wildfowl, just wildfowl, that die in Europe annually um, of lead poisoning. And there's a picture there of a, a, a bird's gizzard cut open. And you can see the, the shot inside. And there's a picture of a, a hooper swan with, with lead poisoning. But it's more than just death. You have all of these other birds then that are affected sublethally. So what you've got is you know, birds dying, but then all of those with subclinical um, effects or you know, welfare effects, which will be on millions more. And we know, for example, that uh, birds with high blood lead levels are more likely to be involved in flying accidents, for example. But we know then that lead affects fecundity, so an ability to reproduce. Um, it affects their immunocompetence and their ability to find food and evade predators. So it has all sorts of ways in which even if you don't die of the poisoning, you might die of starvation or of another disease or whatever. And so not too surprisingly, then we find that lead has population level effects. So if you've got something that kills a lot of adults and stops you breeding very well, that's a very good mechanism then to actually, you know, potentially affect the, the size of your population. And the graph there on the um, left hand side is a, a negative uh, correlation between likelihood to ingest lead and your population trend. So, so birds that ingest a lot of lead are much more likely to have uh, a poor uh, conservation and um, poor population trend, you know, a, a downward population trend. And I think rather compelling evidence is from banning of lead fishing weights. So we banned lead fishing weights in the mid 1980s in this country and mute swans um, were very, very prone to ingesting fishing weights in you know, rivers and, and lakes and so on. Banning the lead fishing weights after they were banned, we saw this real increase in the mute swan po population. And I'm glad that my uh, colleague Kevin Wood um, and some of us sort of got, got together then to think, it, was it really about the lead fishing weights or was it something else going on? And Kevin's very clever, so he did some fancy modeling and you know looked at different things. And it is, it's that removing lead from those mute swans and has resulted in this population increase. And I'm really looking forward to if we can get rid of lead ammunition just to see you know, what might happen then to, to other wildlife that's out there. It's not just, um, not just the wildfowl, other birds as well, which will be ingesting lead by um, this route, um, this sort of terrestrial um, route. But also it's not just the birds that are eating the shot, it's uh, scavengers and predators that are eating shot that might be embedded in prey. So for example, if you look at mallards flying around out, out there, something like one in four of them will have embedded shot where they've been shot at, but they haven't died. Okay, so they're literally carrying embedded shot. So any predators then eating those birds then will be exposed to that lead. And similarly, if you're hunting with a um, bullet and you leave the sort of gut pile out in the field, that's a very um, useful food resource for scavengers. But unfortunately, if it contains big shards of lead, then, um, then we, you know, we'll see lead poisoning in those uh, birds of prey. And again, it's got the sort of sublethal effect as well as the lethal effects. And we know that there are population level effects for all sorts of species, things like golden eagles, white-tailed eagles, and and so on. So we know it's a big problem for your wildfowl and your sort of game birds, and it's a big problem for um, raptors and uh, scavengers as well. But I think something that's been really interesting is seeing some of the evidence coming out about other um, receptors, other hosts that we haven't really thought about very much, which are the mammals. And so we're seeing papers coming out um, in North America and in Scandinavia about the impact of exposure to lead from ammunition on bears 
And these were studies done actually then on baby bears as well. And they were being exposed from milk from their mothers who are in those gut piles when those you know female bears are eating lead within that within their bones they're mobilized when they're pregnant and so on going into young bears and that sort of opens up all sorts of ideas about actually how this toxic you know toxic substance actually you know finds its way into a wider environment that embedded lead um, that i talked about before we always used to think, oh, it probably doesn't do very much to the bird. It's probably sort of isolated, you know, within the bird and you know, a bit walled off and, and not actually having an impact. We now know, um, so there's other authors there, describing it as the hidden threat of actually finding it is leaching into the bodies of birds that are, have got this embedded ammunition. And then, of course, when you think about all that ammunition that goes out there, and particularly for clay pigeon shooting, um, so we've got about 8,000 tonnes or so of lead that go out per year in the UK into the environment. Um, in uh, the EU, it's, it's many tens of thousands of tonnes of lead ammunition that are going out there. And yeah, it's got to go somewhere, hasn't it? It eventually degrades and it degrades and contaminates the soil um, and the plants that are growing in uh, those areas. But also it moves away from areas of high deposition uh, and contaminates water courses as well. So you'll find in the literature, you know, various studies which find exposures in fish, in amphibians, crustacea, um, you know, even mice and so on. So this lead that's going out there is not inert. It is quietly finding its way into all sorts of other receptors. And it's not just the wildlife. Uh, livestock are also affected to a much lesser extent, but it, it certainly happens. And you'll find uh, reports, particularly where you've got heavy lead deposition um, in clay pigeon shoots, for example, where then um, cattle can be exposed, quite often in silage, where it's actually then just gathered up and then, you know, fed to cattle, which has got shot in. I was talking to a, a colleague from the Animal Plants Health Agency um, last week. He said, oh, I've just removed 143 shots from the reticulum of a cow. You know, and you just think, oh, it's quite extraordinary, isn't it? Anyway, the other main um, livestock group there is poultry. So poultry, like game birds, you know, they, you know what chickens are like. They love picking up shot. So certainly when I was working at Slimbridge, we would, I would say, you know, a, a one or two phone calls per year saying, oh dear, you know, my, you know, the, the chap who shoots, you know, next to me, I can hear his shot, you know, tinkling off the roof of my chicken house, and now my chickens are dead, you know, what can I do about it? And you think, well, yeah, this wouldn't happen, would it, if we used <laughs> non-toxic ammunition? Anyway, <laughs> um, here's an interesting one, more and more pheasants and so on being used in dog food, so there's a real sort of move to using, um, uh, or raw foods for pets and you know kind of healthy food by using you know wild foods in in pet food um but if you trawl so some some friends who've been measuring amounts of lead in in pet food but if you trawl um customer reviews of this you'll find people go oh i found a lot of shot in my dog food i contacted the company and they said it wasn't a problem well, you know if you really love your dog you might not want to be feeding it a lot of lead so <laughs> But the big, the big one here is, is the risks to humans. And I know most of us in the room will have tucked into to pheasants and venison all our life and think, well, you know, what, what are you on about? But if you are a frequent consumer, a pregnant woman or a child, you really shouldn't be exposing yourself um, or you should be aware of the risks from lead. So a lead bullet, I think, I think all of us think, oh, if you just sort of, you know, push that lead to one side on your plate, you're all right. I think you're not quite realizing how much lead you're being exposed to because when lead goes into an animal, it can shard, micronize. This is an x-ray of a bullet that's, you know, it's clearly hit um, you know, something hard in there, but you can see how far those bits of lead go throughout the carcass of that deer. Um, and that's what a copper bullet does when it's hit an animal, but that's what a lead bullet will do. So you really see how this sort of shattering and shards of this then you can be eating those and also then when you're cooking your meat you're cooking your pheasant and it's quietly dissolving away into the meat so it's um you're exposing yourself to more, more than you imagine in fact the lead levels that you would get in meat you know wouldn't be a, a, in game meat you wouldn't be allowed to have that in lamb or chicken or whatever but there is no 
um, maximum level for, for game meat. Anyway, what was described as a sort of safe level of lead exposure over the years has gone down and down and down. So we now, you know, essentially describe there is no safe level of lead. And, and in terms of, because of its um, neurodevelopmental impacts, you know, on, on the developing brain, and it is these um, low levels of lead actually which have the sort of disproportionately great impact anyway. So it is a it's a very you know dangerous toxin for toxic substance for um, developing brain. And in terms of you know, how, how much lead are we talking about? So I think this graphic um, I think sort of summarizes it quite well. So this is high um, high level consumers. This is people eating lead you know once a week. So in the red, that's the lead that you would have in that amount of game meat. And in the blue is all the lead that you would be exposed to in the rest of your diet for that week. So you can see your one game meal a week is carrying far more lead, you know, five, six, seven times more lead than you would get in the rest of your diet put together. And for toddlers, and young children, this is, you know, this is a, a, a real problem if you're pregnant and so on as well. But of course, there is a solution to this one. There is actually non-toxic ammunition. And so for shot, steel shot is the same price. Um, it's widely available. Um, and bismuth shot has got characteristics a bit more like lead in many ways, but it's about three times more expensive. And then copper bullets are your um, typical um, non-toxic alternatives for bullets. But it is really the human behavior, the sort of vested interests and so on, which are the powerful barriers that are stopping people then moving to these um, ammunition types. And I would say that it, it has become, a, you know, it is a, a very toxic debate. These, these headlines from the um, shooting media in the UK are from a few years ago, but it is ramping up again because of uh, something I'll, I'll come on to. So you can, you can really see that it becomes, you start off with, you know, you've got your science there, but then it becomes this rather polarized, toxic sort of debate. And so much of this really sort of sits in the kind of human dimensions side of, um, of the whole issue, really. And um, we have tried really hard then with the whole engagement to, to try to you know, develop trusting relationships with a lot of the shooters to try to, you know, just um, open up dialogue uh, you know, being as open and honest as we can with the data and all the rest of it, just to try to see if we can persuade people to, you know, um, just be a bit more open minded about this. You know, this is not an anti shooting thing, this is an anti poisoning. Um, the common ground in those dialogues is okay, if you don't believe me about the birds because you don't see the disease, whatever you do, would you stop feeding all this stuff to your children? That's usually a good sort of common ground uh, way of, you know, having that discussion. So my lovely colleague, um, Julia Newth, she has led um, some of the sort of social science work on this, looking at uh, the different perspectives, perspectives of the different shooting stakeholders. And actually their perspectives fall very neatly into two groups really, which we call the open to change side. They're the ones who are sort of, oh yeah, okay, take your point, lead is quite poisonous, isn't it? Maybe we should change. And the other, status quo, those who really feel that the, you know, the whole science is all made up, what you want about. But there is a sort of consensus in the middle there about, well, whatever the information is, it should come from the shooting organisations. That's a sort of consensus. That's those, the messages from the shooter, other shooters will be more powerful rather than those of us who are just, you know, interested in um, birds and so on. So, so that sort of getting the messages from shooters so my colleagues then have been, for example, to Denmark. So Denmark, um, when it comes to shooting, it's all very progressive. They banned all lead shot in 1996 and they're banning all um, bullets the year after next. So they, they're right on it and they've been using non-toxic shot for, you know, say for decades now. Um, so it's capturing their voices that we can then put in our videos and so on and um, show to hunters in the rest of Europe has been quite powerful. And if only we could get everybody into the post-mortem room at Slimbridge and literally show people a post-mortem and say, that's what we're talking about. These are the shots that come out of the dead birds. You know, now do you sort of believe us? And, and something which, um, you know, I sort of thought, oh, yeah, we need to sort of go to, to the, you know, engage with the peasant people, really. So um, 
eventually persuaded to some of the guys who were doing some of the research on pheasants, could, could we take the portable x-ray machine with us? So went along and they were catching pheasants for doing various bits of work. And I was able to literally x-ray living pheasants there and then and illustrate to their gamekeeper, have this fantastic conversation with their gamekeeper. So here's our um, pheasant in a bag on the left-hand side and looking in that female bird's gizzard there, there were five quite clear bits of shot, and I'm sure then that they would be lead shot, that's what's used on, on that particular shoot. And this, um, this gamekeeper was looking at that, and I said, you know, come, come and look at that, and he was going, why, why, why has it eaten them? And I said, well, because you can see, you know, they eat little stones, don't they, and they eat seeds, and then he was going, yeah, he was going, well, how do they find them? And then he was going, they have got amazing eyesight, haven't they? And then, but then what's going to happen to that bird? And I said, well, it's got five bits of shot. It will, you know, undoubtedly die. And then he was doing this, but there's like 300 shot in every cartridge. <laughs> and he's going, and this place has been shot over for decades. Yeah. He said, and this is quite a low intensity shoot. Yeah. He was thinking about other places where he had worked. And you had this kind of road to Damascus sort of moment. You had, we need that on a huge scale, but you know, it's quite difficult to sort of make that happen. So momentum is building on this. Please, I don't want anybody to, you know, read all of the um, details on this. Just to say, this is 30 years worth of um, work on lead poisoning, but you can just see more and more initiatives and really the momentum is growing on this, this need for regulation. So in the EU, the European Chemicals Agency is tackling this <coughs> in two stages. The first one was a restriction on lead shot in wetlands, which was really to sort of harmonise um, restrictions that a lot of countries have already got. And the second one is then a wider restriction on lead ammunition and fishing weights. And this is all under a chemicals regulation called REACH. You know, don't need to know more about it than that particularly, but under REACH, then we got through the wetland regulation by the skin of our teeth, and it was a fight. We're up against the kind of American gun lobby, so it's a bit scary. Anyway, um, the UK managed to miss that thing that I bust a gut over by about three weeks. So the UK doesn't have to do that first one because of Brexit. Um, but the UK has now got its own reach and it's sort of copied over onto the books um, the restricting lead ammunition. So it's now sort of replicating what the EU is doing for... Um, uh, lead ammunition. So under UK reach, they are now, there's a proposal now to regulate um, lead ammunition. So that's going through the process. I think consultation has just finished just recently, but you can expect plenty more attention for this, uh, attention on this um, over the next year as it becomes a bit more political and a bit more shouty, I imagine. So the future then for lead ammunition, it's traveling in just the one direction because there's going to be more evidence, there's going to be more acceptance that there is a problem that needs a solution. There's going to be more policy and all of those related initiatives, and there will be more reputational and possibly litigation risks. And I think probably shooters or those, you know, polluting clay pigeon grounds and all the rest of it probably need to be a bit aware of that. There's going to be more chance this becomes anti-shooting. And I certainly can see that the, the anti-shooters are you know, are ramping up on this. So I can see that it is going to become, um, you know, probably more polarised. The alternatives are going to be getting better and better. So you can see it's all going in the one direction. And more shared experience means that it normalises really the, the use of these non-toxics. And there will be economic incentives as well. If you want to sell your meat into the EU, for example, you're not going to be able to sell it if, it, if it's full of lead. So a complete phase out of lead ammunition will happen, preferably sooner rather than later. Um, and although it's a one health issue, it will be the human health side of this that drives that even though I've definitely you know, started off on this as the sort of you know, dead birds on the um, post-mortem bench, it will be the human health probably which drives it. So in Waitrose, for example, they committed to going lead free. Um, you know, they, they have started the sort of supermarket demanding it. And I think that that's been very powerful. So just to sort of finish up then, that sort of science to policy, we've got overwhelming 
evidence of harms caused by um, lead ammunition. And there is that solution. But these barriers, um, OK, there are some practical barriers, but they are psychological or even the rules of sports shooting, that it has to be lead. You know, you could change those rules. They are human constructs. But the main barriers there are vested interests. People are making money, actually, out of keeping lead. And those reach regulations in the UK and the EU, there'll be game changers, which will then bring about change in other parts of the world as well, if we get them through, fingers crossed. But it supports, supports sustainable hunting. And it, what excitingly, from a conservation point of view, because very often a conservation success is a temporary thing, but this, this will be permanent. People won't go back to lead. They will have got over themselves and you know, they'll be using non-toxic ammunition. So there's real sort of, you know, big um, One Health gains there. So just to sort of bring that whole thing together, I think if, if we really, you know, focus on prevention, prevention at source, that saves all sorts of problems, doesn't it? There's a sort of joke in um, a lot of this kind of health stuff. There's no prizes in prevention. Nobody, you know, gives you a prize for having prevented a pandemic that they've never actually seen. You know, you, it's very difficult, isn't it, to, to prove that you've stopped something bad happening. Um, but I think that COVID probably should have focused our minds more on the importance of health and the importance of healthy ecosystems. I'm sort of slightly fearful that our minds are now a bit too distracted. But um, I think it has, in the kind of global health world, people are thinking about looking after the environment more to prevent pandemics. And I think if you think about a proper One Health as a kind of framing concept. It makes you make the right choices. You're doing the right thing for wildlife and livestock and human health. It's probably the sustainable uh, choice, the sustainable action. So I'm a scientist, you know, your science is important, but I think that you've kind of got to move into the whole world of social science and all the rest of it then to understand these human behaviors and vested interests, which then as I say, they extend these timelines to take sort of health protective um, actions. And I think we can see that with a lot of environmental issues, whether it's climate change or whatever. So I will leave it there. And thank you very much. For <laughs> your says thank you for a great talk about bird flu our local experience here in Fairford is the loss of our entire family of six cygnets to bird flu at adult size gray feather stage this year a small thing in global terms but a cause of real grief for one yeah. small town after some years of an infertile pair on the traditional nest site perhaps due to lead poisoning we had a fertile and successful young pair only to lose the entire brood to bird flu it, it, it's horrible, isn't it? And it's very personal, isn't it? Because you'd have watched those from the first eggs being laid, you know, getting through all of those. Yeah, so I, I can imagine it's heartbreaking. I feel heartened that the adults didn't die. And of course, that's one of the problems. You know, those young birds will have absolutely no previous experience of any viruses. So, you know, maybe the older ones have. Maybe the older ones have, and hopefully they can breed again next year when there's less virus around, fingers crossed. Yeah. Could I make a comment yeah. on that? I watched the last of those signals that well not die, but dying in the room in fact of couldn't do anything about it. It's awful. awful. Yeah. And in, in fact, in some of the response planning to this, I, I think that um possibly DEFRA hadn't quite understood how, how big a, a, a personal impact this thing would have. In in some ways the um seabird breeding colonies offshore, people weren't, unless you work there, you weren't having to look at it, you know, so much, but to actually, you know, you want to do something, don't you, you know, but there's unfortunately there's really nothing, nothing you can do in those situations, it's horrid. Yeah. Yes, um, thank you for your talk. Is it reaching our garden birds? Because we, I really, there's a dearth of garden birds and I'm, I've met five dead pigeons just on my country walks recently that just ordered and suffering. Is that happening? Well, you know, it, it, sh it shouldn't do because the, although, you know, they are avian influenza virus and they, they, you know, can affect any bird species, but you typically <coughs> don't expect to see it in your small garden birds. 
So pigeons and so on can, but it's not what you expect. So I, I don't, the answer is, you know, I, I don't know. Um, and it's possible that this year's, you know, drought and all the rest of it maybe has uh, affected some of those smaller birds, but, but I don't know. And the way to try and find, at least if you find carcasses, if they can be submitted for <clears throat> testing, although you have to have more than five birds in a place at once or something to get them tested, but that, that would be a good way to rule it in or rule it out. Yeah. I'm a little puzzled by some of the numbers. You talk, I'm talking now about farmed chickens. Um, you talk about something like 2,000 chick, um, chickens being culled. Sorry, 2,000 chickens catching it, and then millions being yeah. culled. Yeah. And it seems totally out of the, the figures. It, do you mean to say that if one chicken in a big farm catches it, you cull the whole lot? Yeah, is that, that necessary? That's, well, so that is the, the stamping out policy that has always gone on. There's this absolute mindset of, if it gets in, you want to stamp it out, cleanse and disinfect. But we can see over, over these past couple of years where the number of outbreaks has been so enormous that the calls for vaccinating poultry have, have grown and grown. And that used to be a complete anathema. It was a, no, 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 it will mask the disease and we must never do it. But I think there's a real sort of realisation of this is probably all we're going to be able to do. If, if this is going to be so common, then probably vaccination of poultry will, will end up being what everyone does. Will that be effective? And, and it should be effective, yes. And yeah, But but it, it calls for, it's not a sort of straightforward thing to do because it calls for a complete change of how we deal with poultry <laughs> outbreaks. And when you have got a sort of global system that says it's notifiable, you cull, cleanse and disinfect, so there's lots of things that need to be changed to to make that then, you know, the, the automatic response. Yes. So are these preventative <clears throat> actions carried out in other parts of the world, like, the, like China? So, um, in fact, the the culling, yes, certainly though that sort of culling, where where you've got industrial scale production, that culling, cleansing, disinfecting and so on, that, that is a sort of standard practice. Um, where you have the, a lot of wild duck farming, um, and very often those wild ducks are then sort of taken into natural settings, you know, they are meant to all be culled. But of course, where you've got people who haven't got very much money, you, you don't necessarily want to tell the authorities that your birds are looking a bit rosy. If you don't get compensated, and very often, you know, if your birds are looking a bit ropey, you might kill them and eat them. You know, that, that's one way of at least gaining the protein from them. Um, but it means that, you know, in, infection sort of keeps going. But that sort of stamping out thing, it is, um, it is certainly something that goes on around the world, but to various levels of efficacy. Yeah. Is there an understanding yet of the future Mm. avian flu is it likely that um, immunity will suppress it yeah. in the future or is it variability will mean that there won't be immunity do, do, do you know that it's um i hear people quite often sort of saying it's a bit of a mug game to try to predict what's going to happen next but of course we're all going well what's going to happen next so i i have a terrible fear that this much fitter virus is, is probably here to stay but i think that it will probably do this over time um you know with outbreaks in naive birds and those who've seen it before probably less so um but i think it'll get into night you know novel settings as i say you know i'm worried about some of the southern um seabird breeding places and i would be afraid of what that's going to do so i think that we will see terrible seasons and not so bad seasons and what normally happens in a, a sort of stable environment is your pathogen becomes a bit less pathogenic and your hosts become a bit more immune, you know, so that the peaks and troughs should be, you know, let less awful. <laughs> but but if your virus is just it's like Ebola or something, you know, if if Ebola is just very good at killing things, and if it, you know, it doesn't get any less pathogenic over time, does it? It's um so anyway, we, we have to hope that it it is a virus that finds its niche and becomes less pathogenic. But I think we might still be some way before we see that sort of becoming, you know, less, less awful. 
Yeah. Is there any evidence for it being transmissible to a human being? Um, in that, that early H5N1, in fact, the, the current H5N1 that we've got is, is a bit different. That early one, um, people could catch. It was an unusual virus to catch, but there were quite a lot of cases. Actually, I, I, I took a slide out of um, that, that. There were some hundreds of cases over about a decade, which actually isn't very many when we think about how, how widespread it was. So, so it can be caught by people, and the mortality of that original virus was quite high. So not many people caught it, but quite a high proportion of those people who did catch it died of it. But this, this current one has got a sort of lower zoonotic potential. So you should be careful, you know, if, if you've got pigeons that you're seeing around and about, you know, if you're picking them up or whatever, you know, definitely be very careful and um, so on, probably the advice is, you know, don't touch things. But at the moment, it's still really, this particular one is, is very much a, a third, third disease. H5N1 has been included this year in the, um, certainly the Punjab I have. It was one of the tetravalent. Oh, right. So okay. H5N1. And it did say which fear it accepts. Do you know, I didn't know that. So that's yeah. in the flu jab that you yeah. had. Right. Yes, How is. interesting. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Well, that's good. I'm a bit out of touch actually with them. I was a bit more in touch when I was still working at Slimbridge and we used to sort of push for getting flu jabs for our staff as the frontline workers. That's interesting to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, another comment following on from your comment about don't touch. Yeah. We worked for Wildlife Trust mm -hmm. and puts up notices on its reserves now saying if you find a dead bird, do not pick it up, yeah. photograph it, record yeah. the position, and let them know. Yeah, of course they won't come and pick it up though. Well, so, you know, this, um, in fact, it's one, of, it's one of the good things about WWT is that um, the, the reserve staff there and the volunteers and so on are sort of used to picking up dead birds for our long term post mortem thing. So, so people are used to using PPE and then, you know, the birds can be post mortems in the um, cabinet and that sort of thing but at least it means that you get your hands on birds to get some samples for surveillance because at the moment we've got so many unknowns because we haven't got a good enough system of actually you know doing that sort of you know test, testing birds I'm yes. wondering I would assume that having seen a dead pigeon the other day and it disappeared overnight I assume that the next ones to catch it would be the foxes so actually that um is interesting that this particular virus um, has spilled into other wild mammals, and that's always a bit of a worry because you really you don't want something with a big wide host range that you know can can go into mammals. But we've seen it in um, seals, for example, and in foxes as well, and martins and that sort of thing. So so it can those cases do exist. Yes. Um, people who are consuming game birds much must be the gamekeepers. Yeah. Does anyone just look at the level of lead in their blood compared to the normal population? Um, well, uh, you know, there would be great studies to do, wouldn't they? As you know, but it might do, be convincing. <laughs> it might do. It, it's the ethics of having to do that sort of study, is, you know, things are horrendous, aren't they, these days? But um, those, those are just the sort of studies that need to happen. It's just quite difficult, isn't it? To, yeah. I'm, I'm sure it would. I, I was I was speaking to an Albanian bloke once who was he said, Oh, you're working on lace. Oh yeah, he said it's a standing joke in my country. All the children of um gamekeepers are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Oh, I've got no idea about that. But anyway, he said that 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 was his the yeah, <laughs> I have to say, and I'm sorry then for any shooters that are in here, it's the number of meetings I've been in where somebody's like, oh, I've been eating this all my life and it's never done me any harm. And there's a sort of tumbleweed moment of, you know, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, the seal seal is the same price. Yeah. It, it, it's one of these things, you know, we have always used it and it has always worked well. How very dare you? I don't want to be bothered with you and your 
for the idea. So there's that sort of side of things. And then you've got the vested interest, the ammunition, and, and actually go, it does go up to American gun lobby saying this is an attack on us. And so, and then the poor hunters in the field are, are told nonsense very often, you know, and they, you know, there's cognitive dissonance, you know, you hear this stuff that you believe in and everything else is, is bad. So, yeah, people, there's a lot of misinformation there, but it's, you know, the, the costs shouldn't be for, for a shot. There shouldn't be any barriers there at all. But, yeah. It, it's about 8,000 tonnes per year in the UK. Um, yeah, it's quite, quite a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry, everyone. <laughs> Well, sorry, I'm not yeah. <laughs> Right, any any last questions? Well, sorry, can I ask? Because you said you forecast on how much turkeys are going to cost. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I have absolutely no idea. And I, this, this sounds really stupid. I've got some friends who are just about to go away for um, Christmas, so we had an early Christmas dinner on Sunday, and I just thought. I know that those people selling them that turkey will have been glad that they were buying early. And on, you know, farming today, you hear you hear those turkey farmers saying I they feel very sorry for them. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so do I. They are wanting to get to a point where they can kill their turkeys really are, soon. Are they putting in extra protection? I mean, well, I'm, yeah, they're all meant to be housed and so on at the moment, aren't they? So, yeah, no, it's a good question. I'm still puzzled about this culling. You know something, yeah. if one person in Sarancester gets COVID, you don't cull the whole Sarancester. <laughs> <laughs> Although no. maybe one should. I know. <laughs> you know. It's, it's, it's a sort of you know sense of the worth of chickens, isn't it? And it has worked historically, but that disease control response has worked previously, but it isn't, it's, you know, it's not really <laughs> working. <laughs> Yeah, 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 and for foot and mouth, all that sort of response of just, you know, get rid of all hair. Yeah. Any, any last questions on Zoom? No, no. Yeah. no? Yeah. Okay, okay. We'll wrap up there. I guess the, the key takeaway from the talk this evening is if you're struggling to get a turkey for Christmas, don't choose a pheasant. <laughs> <laughs> or, de or demand from oh. your game dealer that it is shot with non-toxic oh, right. Yeah, right. consumer right. pressure. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.